Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's um, first session in our new Talking About Land series. Um, my name is Alex Dowdall. I'm a policy officer in the Housing Agency, and I'm very pleased to, to welcome you all here today. Um, this is a hybrid event, so we're coming to you live from Tangent, which is the idea space in the Trinity College Dublin Business School. Um, and we also have a panelist and an audience joining us online via Zoom. Um, so I guess I'd just like to say that my role today is technical host, and I'm going to be uh, doing my best to, to, to moderate between the in-room audience and the online audience. So, you know, I'll be, I'll be uh, bringing forward any questions that are inserted into the, the Q&A function in Zoom to, to our panel here in the room. So you'll be hearing from me again later on in, in, in that respect. But right now, I'd just like to hand over to the CEOs of the Housing Agency and the Land Development Agency to say a few introductory remarks. So first off, we'll be hearing from Bob Jordan, who is the CEO of the Housing Agency, and afterwards, John Coleman, who is the CEO of the Land Development Agency. So Bob. Thanks a lot, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you in the room and particularly those online um, to this, I suppose, first of this exciting series of talks entitled Talking About Land. Um, my name is Bob Jordan. I'm the CEO of the Housing Agency, basically a government body uh, that supports the delivery of housing and sustainable communities throughout Ireland in close collaboration with our colleagues in the Department of Housing local authorities and approved housing bodies, and also working very closely with other state agencies like the Land Development Agency. Um, this series of talks is a joint initiative of the Housing Agency, the Land Development Agency, and the Geary Institute for Public Policy in University College Dublin. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the commitment of my colleagues, Professor Michelle Norris, who's the director of the Geary Institute, and uh, John Coleman, CEO of the Land Development Agency, in really making this series happen. We should be talking about that. And how long it's taken us to get here, but we're here. Um, it's about 30, 40 of you in the room and 250 people in the register. So it's, this is a hot topic. Um, and I think, you know, and, and the breadth of expertise, I think, from the housing sector online just shows what, I, I suppose, a, an item of discussion it is for all of us who work every day in housing. But we also look forward to your participation in the questions and answer session later on. Um, our topic for today and for the six further sessions is public land management. And our speakers today will consider why and how do governments intervene in land markets. And just to say there's plenty happening in terms of active land management initiatives at the moment. The government's Housing for All plan acknowledges that the first building block of housing supply is and it's committed to a new approach to active land management and introduced several initiatives um, aimed at activating stage in private lands. And I'm just going to name check some of them. So new urban development zones, which have potential, I think, significant potential for development of housing and other purposes. Um, strategic housing developments, as you know, have been replaced by a new planning process for large scale uh, residential developments. Um, land value sharing is being introduced to ensure communities get, uh, I suppose, a greater share of the uplift in the value, um, you know, in the increase in value arising from local authority planning decisions and investments in things like infrastructure. John's going to talk about it, but obviously the work of the LDA has been supported and strengthened under Housing for All, especially in terms of activating state lands and making them available for residential purposes. And then a lot of work is happening in the agency around activating existing planning permissions. You will have heard of the pre conaha city scheme, which is really about making sure that apartment developments happen in our urban centers for home purchasers. And I suppose I should say, um, just in case you don't know, that the Housing Agency does make land uh, available for housing development under what's called the, the Land Aggregation Scheme. I can't get into that today. But for example, we've been collaborating with the Land Development Agency on three very large sites in Balbriggan, Skerries and Nace that have the potential to deliver about 1,300 uh, social and affordable homes, very large scale, and that's on top of about 680 homes that have already been delivered on housing agency land. So, you know, if all those homes come to pass, we'll have contributed land toward 2,000 homes. I suppose just to go back to today, the point of the series is, is not to discuss, you know, Irish land management policies in the main, but rather to learn from international best practice and to consider whether the, some, some of the practices that we have in other countries could be applied here. Uh, and each week we'll learn from an international expert who will talk about land management practice in their country. And then we'll have an Irish case speaker, I suppose, to comment on the case study and to try and translate it or situate it in the Irish context and to see if there's something we can learn 
brand land management from it. And um, so as a taster, just to say our speakers will be from Austria, Finland, Germany, and the United Kingdom. And the topics to be covered over the next six sessions, today is an introductory session, are public land banking, public land leasing, uh, land pooling and readjustment, land value capture, land value tax, and inclusionary zoning. So pretty much every angle you can think of in terms of looking at land, we're going to cover over this uh, seven series session. And I suppose, you know, like you, I'm looking forward to these talks. We definitely, there's a lot of us here who are interested in uh, activating land. Um, and I think that we can learn a lot from this series. And I suppose just to say, um, just to welcome Julie online as well, because I haven't spoken to Julie, but just uh, Julie has played a, a very active role, I suppose, in lots of um, talks and series in Ireland. As well. <laughs> Hi, Julie. <laughs> um, and now I suppose I just want to hand over to John. John is going to talk about today's session and introduce the speakers and obviously talk about the role of the Development of today. So thanks, John. Might get, might get photo bombed or <laughs> Hopefully she didn't do the rapid news <laughs> uh, behind me. But uh, hello everyone and hello to our online participants as well. And thanks very much for attending today. And uh, thanks to the Housing Agency and the Geary Institute as well for being the catalyst uh, behind the series of discussions. So we're very grateful. And I was especially keen, I guess, for the LDA to get involved. I mean, there's so much pressure on housing and the immediacy of the need to deliver it, but sometimes we forget about some of the core reasons why uh, we uh, have landed in this spot. And I think land management, active land management is a big part of that over the longer term. And indeed, the genesis of the LDA and how we deal with our long-term land management issues um, was the core idea uh, behind the LDA uh, to play a more kind of interventionist role in land management and making sure that we have enough land in the right place at the right time. Uh, to deliver mixed uh, tenure communities, including affordable housing. So that, that was the, the whole idea behind the LDA. And uh, the, the premise of the, the 2018 NESC report, uh, Urban Development Land, Housing and Infrastructure Fixing Urban Program System, uh, talked about that, supported the creation of what they call the National Regeneration and Development Agency, which we, it's a bit of a mouthful, so we, we uh, came up with the Development Agency instead. Very happy to see Noel Cattle here, actually. Uh, because we would have interacted very extensively in the lead up to the creation of the LDA. Uh, but that supported uh, the creation of a body like the LDA um, to kind of institutionalize a more muscular interventionist role of the state in, in land management uh, and uh, for a greater use of public land uh, to bring forward more coherent delivery. So um, the, the report of NESC and its precursors were significant influences in our creation. And I guess what that means is discussions like this matter, ideas come from it. There are a lot of influential people around that can transpose what we discuss and good ideas and learnings from other jurisdictions to, into our own policies. So it's very important to note. Um, the issues we'll discuss today at this and other talks as a result are, are very core uh, to what the LBA is about and to its being. And I look forward to being an active participant in them. I think the, the uh, report, Judy's report, is a great summary and a great uh, outline of successes. and. and you know, earnings indeed from other jurisdictions too. And I note, Judy, actually, if you're listening there, uh, your analysis of the Dutch uh, system, particularly uh, in the 90s, uh, which uh, was a collection of policy initiatives called Binex policies, uh, brought about a massive increase, 7% increase in the in the Dutch housing uh, delivery uh, over a 15-year uh, period. And uh, so the report talks about success there. That was very much in the thinking when we set up the LDA. And in fact, a lot of the uh, ideas and some of the themes that are coming through the report uh, are been reflected, I think, in the forthcoming urban development zone. So, so again, these, these discussions matter. Um, so I mostly, from my perspective, look forward to uh, learning uh, from the speakers that are, that are uh, here. We have a great lineup of speakers, uh, including uh, today. Um, with Julie and uh, Michelle Norris uh, in particular. But just to introduce you to, to the speakers, um, Dr. Judy Lawson, uh, the adjunct professor at CUR or MIT Australia, uh, an experienced international housing researcher, urban planner, public policy analyst, and has looked at and managed uh, research for international uh, organizations, national and regional governments, as well as industry and advocacy, so obviously a very broad uh, breadth of, of experience across the spectrum. Uh, Judy led the drafting of the Landmark Housing 2030 initiative with her own Michelle Norris and Holger Ballbaum, if that's the correct pronunciation, uh, for the UN East, uh, 
UN habitat and housing Europe, highlighting policy tools and good practices for affordable, inclusive, and energy efficient housing. She's also long time co editor of the internationally renowned journal on housing theory and society, and active creator of informative research by podcasts, academic publications, and industry journals. Um, her recent international comparative work that I uh, just referenced. Post crisis urban recovery of housing system governance, finance, and land policies for affordable and inclusive housing. It's very noteworthy, and she completed the international review uh, of land policies for affordable and inclusive housing, and um, led the influential research on social housing, infrastructure inquiry, and investment capital report, as well as the projects of financial community securities, providing key evidence for all establishment of national housing. Thank you. Very relevant. And online. Um, so that's Julie. And Michelle Norris uh, is a uh, professor of social policy and director of the Erie Institute for Public Policy. Uh, her teaching and research interests focus on housing policies in urban regeneration, particularly on the provision, management, financing of social housing in Europe. The regeneration of social housing states in our urban areas, which is very relevant a lot of the work that Lady is doing in the city. She's led over 30 research projects on these issues and produced 200 public. So huge places uh, in terms of policy. Very strong links with policy makers uh, in Ireland internationally. And 2011 and 2016, she was appointed by the Taoiseach as an independent member of S, National Economic and Social Council, which advises government social and economic policy quite effectively, uh, as evidenced by my presence here today. Um, between 2012, 2001, she chaired the board of the Housing Finance Agency, which has a body in the social and affordable housing in Ireland, which is 4.6 billion in debt. And in 2008, she was appointed to the board of the Land Development Agency, uh, agency uh, that I'm chief executive of. And in 2021, she was appointed by the Minister for Housing to the Commission set up to examine the long term future of housing in Ireland. So, clearly, very strong link between research policy and implementation which covers the full spectrum. So that's our speakers. I think it's going to be a fascinating series and thanks very much for attending. Great, thanks very much. So um, Julie, I'd just like to invite you to, to start into your presentation. Now I think you should have control of the slide, so you should be good to go. Okay. So here we are. Thanks very much, Bob and John. Thanks very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Very pleased to be part of this public discussion, taking part in Dublin today and continuing over the next few weeks. It makes sense for us all to be together both online and in person. So very glad so many people were able to come together today. And I can see there's over, over 160 people involved online as well, which is just magnificent. And I understand also from uh, uh, many, many from Ireland, but also internationally are involved online. So that's fantastic um, and to see so much interest. As you know, housing development and the affordability of the homes that are created are subject to many imp important relationships which are integral. So firstly, of course, property relations, um, influencing the promotion of urban development and consumption and production of the dwellings themselves. And secondly, the circuit of investment that goes into those homes, their resale, um, as well as their production and their, um, their uh, ongoing maintenance and so on. And thirdly, we also mustn't forget the very important relationship around the labour force, around our incomes, our wages, conditions, and our assistance to those in the form of any form of welfare assistance and so on it, to help us with the consumption of housing. So we see that in each of the countries that we're going to be looking at today, those things are defined very, very differently and they don't remain static. They change. They are subject to the kind of debates that we're going to have today. So um, it's important um, to, to put property and land policy in the context of those other things. But know that it does, land policy in particular, 
has a very important role in the distribution and access and form of the housing which we produce and consume and will affect different rights of possession, uh, the use and development rights, how we reward uh, the costs of occupation or use or exchange and how they are allocated. So we're going to focus on land policies and in particular focus on what role they can play in a more purposeful role in, in generating more affordable and accessible um, housing outcomes. So um, according to um, uh, great thinkers in, in urban planning, um, for example, John Friedman, in his classic text, Planning in the Public Domain, which is one of the original Bibles for urban planners um, and their practice. Planning is about a lot of things. Um, it's about guiding economic development to promote um, sustainable and, and stable uh, forms of economic and social activity, about also helping the provision of public services to meet general needs. It's also about investing in infrastructure, we could consider housing also as a form of infrastructure as well, especially when the private sector may not be able or willing to supply in the appropriate um, quantity or, or service levels. It's also about subsidising sectors to encourage particular actions to occur. So planning is, is about lots and lots of things and land policy is just, you know, one part of, of planning in a sense, a very important part. So when when we look at uh, um, about uh, I just go back one slide if I may I'm not quite sure if I can do that yeah housing 2030 is a um, a report which is very important to this presentation today which was examining um, the experience of land policy and finance and governance and environmental standards affecting housing in 56 countries. It was an initiative of international agencies, UN Economic Commission for Europe, which was actually set up during the Marshall Plan era, UN Habitat, which is concerned about the right to adequate housing, and Housing Europe, which is the federation of, of, of providers of housing in the public interest, cooperatives, uh, public housing, not-for-profit uh, forms of housing. So they work together to support this um, uh, focused attention on, on land policies. But we couldn't have done this work without the support of the Housing Agency of Ireland, which gave important, if you like, catalyzing funding to, to do this work. And this work has had um, global impact, in fact. It produced a report, of course, webinars involving more than 1,200 people, a growing podcast series which continues to extend today, and an audience which has been involved many in international events from the COP26 in Glasgow to the World Urban Forum recently in Katowice in Poland. So thanks to the Housing Agency, and the support also of the Housing Finance and Development Corporation in Finland, this work has been able to get out and will be shared also with you today. But influential behind one of the chapters in this report was a work piece of work that um, I did with Hanu Ruanavara, which was an international review of land policies for affordable and inclusive housing, which was supported by the Finnish Academy of Sciences in 2020-2021. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear that that work was also read by many people in the Housing Finance Agency, the Housing Agency and the Land Development Agency. That's great. And that it has played some role in informing and progressing uh, progress in, in, in Ireland. So please <laughs> keep that up. So what this presentation will outline is, as I mentioned, public land making, public land leasing, land pooling and readjustment, land value recapture and taxation, regulatory planning measures, for example, inclusionary zoning, and also attempts to bring those tools together to work as one and focus on neighbourhood level, uh, more comprehensive or precinct planning, and also raise some um, concerns 
and issues and challenges for planning re in relation to the new economy, uh, the digital platform and real estate uh, economy, um, which is becoming um, uh, uh, more and more important to, to deal with. So this report is being circulated in the chat and I'm very glad um, that it continues uh, to be of use and of interest. So I'm going to be drawing on, on that report uh, today. And what I'm going to do is just tiptoe through each and give a definition and also some illustrations very, very briefly. I've only got about 10 minutes, so I've got to be really concise. We can come back to some of this in the um, discussion afterwards, in the report in the full, and later over the next six weeks, there'll be a focus on each one of these types of tools. Of course, the most active tool is public land banking. Of course, land banking is an activity that's done by both the private and the public sector. But in the public sector, of course, it's all about um, promoting uh, good planning and good outcomes for communities. And we see some very famous proponents of the practice of governments acquiring land in advance of need, often at a lower cost in order to pursue strategic development goals, such as the provision of key infrastructure, including low cost land for affordable housing. Low cost land for affordable housing is a one of the most effective ways of actually ensuring that affordable housing is able to be produced. And we see that being used with great success in Singapore through its land banking efforts um, in Vienna, which you're going to hear about later in later weeks, through Vienna's land banker, Von Fond, providing sites for affordable housing to fulfil their strategic plan. Also, for many decades, you see Dutch municipal land companies working side by side with housing corporations and uh, local municipalities to um, deliver um, on housing needs in particular areas. They now do that according to um, a participatory process to produce a housing vision, which is required for each city under the 2015 Housing Act. So municipalities together with housing um, advocacy groups, for example, the tenants associations and um, housing providers have to work together with the local land banker, the public land banker, to develop a needs-based vision for what kind of development they need to promote. You see in West Australia, Australia has, of course, is a federation of uh, states and territories. Each of those has its own land banker, which was set up in the 1970s by the then Whitlam government. Those land development corporations have revolve now differently and have different mandates and visions. West Australia is probably the most effective of all of them, which has um, worked hand in hand with uh, the um, uh, with the financing of affordable housing and with non-profit affordable housing providers to together provide a whole spectrum of housing um, delivery options from affordable housing, for home ownership to not-for-profit um, affordable rental and also housing for people who are homeless. You see sometimes though that these measures can go into overdrive and oversupply. And an example of that, it's of course what's happening in China with the role of municipal land bankers acting as growth machines and promoting extensive um, provision of housing, but sometimes also extensive overgrowth and oversupply leading to even to ghost cities um, and eventually to collapsed um, real estate markets. Many uh, cities have, uh, or many land bankers, public land bankers have also chosen not to sell sites. They consider the land that they have such a scarce commodity and the opportunities um, for, for housing so narrow that they need to focus on um, th those um, much longer term uh, affordable housing options, which 
may not be successfully provided through sale for home ownership, which may deliver, for example, only one generation of purchases that benefit from the affordability. So in, in cities such as Helsinki, which in fact owns 70% of the land around the city, they have um, developed forms of tenure and leasing arrangement to those which offer the security of home ownership but um, also ensure the long-term benefits of affordability over time. You may wish to explore when you look with Finland together the right to occupy housing um, and also the way in which they work together with not-for-profit housing providers to ensure that the longevity of the housing affordability outcomes are maintained. In Munich, for example, they've also revised their land banking policies so that they do no longer sell land. Um, they certainly continue to acquire it, but they no longer sell land for home ownership. Rather, they have adopted a policy of long-term 99-year leases, which involve um, a range of defined segments which they feel need to be supported. In this instance, 30% of the um, leases are to cooperatives and another 30% to non-profit uh, affordable housing, rental housing. You see also in um, cities emerge, who, which have traditionally not had a particularly strong role in land policy, um, now coming to the fore in a much more active period of, um, of, of affordable housing promotion. Barcelona is very much an up and coming city to watch. With regards to their land policy, it includes, amongst many other things, also dedicated sites for community or collaborative forms of housing. And they have allocated dedicated sites for community land trusts to ensure that there is space within their broad housing market for innovation <clears throat> and also for the missing middle. These projects are often on a relatively small scale and it's very interesting to hear and learn more about those. Land instruments can of course play a very important role where private initiative is lacking and land pooling and land readjustment is one such tool that governments can play very very effectively, use it very very effectively to maximise the public interest um, involved uh, in, in, in pooling together often fragmented or blighted areas. Um, and that's um, those type of tools have been used with success in Germany, which has a very long tradition of doing so. And uh, there are guides in the Housing 2030 report step by step how Germany applies this process. But also they've been used um, as a step up in um, uh, development, for example, in South Korea, which during its post-war reconstruction and later on used these two tools to significant effect when they had very little resources to do so themselves, lifting um, uh, the country, in fact, from the level of development of Ghana at the time to now, which is the 11th economy of the world. So these instruments I've written about in a, um, an article called From Hanok to High Rise in Asian Public Policy, where, where those step-by-step -step, um, instruments have been used um, for the modernization and recovery of, of the city of Seoul. Another example, as I've mentioned earlier, is Singapore, which with its Land Resettlement Act um, has used scarce and housing resources effectively channel, channeled to produce high quality or to underpin high, high quality, um, fairly high density public rental housing and transform relative slum conditions um, into the modern city of today. Land value recapture, of course, is another such tool where gains which are not attributable to the individual owner but are the result of public actions, 
for example, um, by the connections of a road or by provision of infrastructure, that this betterment um, be captured not by the individual owner or the occupier of the land, but shared by the broader community. And the effects to, to of capturing this benefit um, are known as land value recapture. And you can see that how that's been used in, once again, China in allocation of use rights to capture the, the sale proceeds of those use rights and reinvest them in very significant levels of urban development. It's also a tool which Ireland uses, and we hear about uh, going to hear about that possibly later. Um, the UK, of course, is famous for its Section 106 and its community infrastructure level levy, both of which are now um, uh, under some controversy about who should be able to share the proceeds uh, or, or engage in the use of those Section 106. Should it be the for-profit sector for affordable housing or should it be the non-profit sector to produce more social and affordable housing as well? We also see um, very innovative um, approaches used in the United States with their tax and increment financing models, which earmark particular tax revenues from anticipated increases in values from investment and makes expenditures to further those planning objectives. There's a very good report on TIF in the um, Lincoln Institute for Land Policies website. That's the TIF scheme. Finally, regulatory planning is, is um, often much maligned by development interests who uh, see it as a blockage or as a delaying tactic or as an impediment to, um, to residential development. But in fact, no, no planning and no um, control over land use can also impede effective um, supply. We see that now happening in the Netherlands, where it's much more of a negotiated um, process involving numerous players, and there is lack of clarity and certainty about which segments of the housing market are to be developed for. That lack of certainty, that openness and availability has also undermined supply as well. So there are two sides to this debate very much around planning and its effectiveness. You see it being used to a significant degree in the United States with inclusionary zoning and density bonus schemes. Again, those schemes are responsible for providing many of the sites under which not-for-profit uh, housing is in fact developed in the United States today. You see in France, the national law are being applied um, on urban inclusion, which has ensured well-located and widely distributed social housing across areas and which have more or less. And you see that really quite a strong instrument also involving enforcement with the use of fines, um, which, is, which is quite a significant um, supplier of, of, of sites as well. Worth having a look at that. I mentioned England and Scotland's slightly differing approaches to providing sites for needed affordable housing. And mention should also be made of the way in which Vienna is trying to apply new upzoning and change of zoning requirements and at critical moments um, requires the provision of a proportion, in this case 30% of social housing or non-profit limited profit forms of housing to be provided on sites where there's up, up zoning um, to occur. So when, it, the, when such regulatory instruments are long-term, they're clear, they create certainty and encourage appropriate forms of residential investment. Oh, just going back again, you just go back one slide. Um, it's important also that these tools of course be used together. Um, and uh, Finland, which you're going to hear from also later on in this series, has um, adopted an approach where it brings together housing needs with transport infrastructure requirements, investment in those things alongside 
municipal land policy. And together, they work together. So the infrastructure, the financing and the land uh, form agreements. They call them MAL agreements. Helsinki has an MAL agreement, which specifies um, a, an amount of money and amount of housing in particular segments of the market that need to be and will be supported by um, the city with funding from the federal government, in, uh, the central government in this case. You see that approach also being applied in Scotland with their housing needs and demand assist assessment, to, which is coupled with the social housing investment plans. Um, with an affordable housing program. I understand a similar model is also being applied in Ireland as well. And we see also in Berlin, um, you have this idea of the social city of neighbourhood investment, where at the precinct level, um, particular investments are tailored to ensure um, socially inclusive housing outcomes. So land policy is not something which is to be seen as a single instrument, but in combination with forms of investment as well. Let's not forget, though, of course, outside of all of this, is uh, circuits of financial uh, uh, governing financial flows of investment, um, which are channeling uh, funding and, and investment into the residential real estate market. Those um, Instruments, for example, land value taxation, stamp duty, you might call it, um, vacancy rules and vacancy taxations, um, regulations which affect short term letting, um, also regulations which affect withholding taxes and so on, on real estate investment trusts. These kind of um, instruments are also going to affect um, the, uh, it's where the, the, they, they, they touch land policy very much. So there should be part of the conversation, very much part of the discussion uh, in Ireland about how to ensure appropriate forms of residential um, investment and uh, development and consumption. So where to from now? Main point is to make is that land policy is part of the solution part of the solution, but a very, very important part of, of the keys to affordability, also addressing energy efficiency and low carbon living and economic stability and um, preventing excessive crisis and volatility. It's very important to build expertise and capacity in this policy area, which for some decades in many countries has suffered from what we would call policy amnesia. And adapting and refining useful tools, sharing and learning from good and bad experience is now more important than ever. It's important that from the very top, a clear mandate is given to those who hold the levers of land policy that it needs to play a key role in affordability, sustainability and inclusive uh, communities. It's also important, of course, that that be a transparent and well-governed process, and this requires good monitoring with the community as well as civic engagement in discussions about what is best for land policy in new countries. Thank you. Here are some selected resources. So if you eventually get the PowerPoint incomplete, you can go straight to some of the resources used in this presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay. So thank you, Julie, for a very clear um, but also very comprehensive presentation. Um, I'm Michelle Norris from the Geary Institute in UCD, and I'm just going to follow up some, some very brief comments and reflections on Julie's presentation and um, its relevance to the Irish situation. Um, so the, the theme of the, of the webinar is why and how governments um, should intervene in land markets. And Julie mentioned 
the importance of governments intervening in land markets to supplying affordable and social housing. But I think in the Irish context, um, it, it's important to spell out exactly why this is so important and why this is so central to social and affordable housing delivery. Um, so it, it seems obvious, but one of the things that's important to understand is the context in which we're delivering, trying to deliver social and affordable housing has changed quite significantly in recent decades. And that's made the um, active management of land by government um, particularly important and critical. Um, so as somebody who's written a book on the, the history of social housing in Ireland, I'm often asked, how did we manage to provide all this social housing in the 1920s, 30s, 40s and 50s, when the country was a lot poorer than we are now? Um, now I only have 10 minutes to speak, and obviously there's lots of factors that influence <laughs> what happened. So, uh, how long have you got? Um, uh, but one of the key factors was land, which is often forgotten about. Um, so in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, when we built, for instance, the picture of Sally Noggin in, in South Dublin, one of the, one of the big um, developments built at the time, which provided really um, important, affordable and good quality housing, people coming from inner city um, slum housing. Um, this was built in the context of an underdeveloped land use planning system where we had no land use planning system until the 1960s. And it was pried very loosely um, uh, for many decades afterwards. And also there was very, very little competition from land in, for land from the private sector at the time. So the major developer within Dublin was Dublin City Council of, of Council Housing. Um, but also a majority of the private housing built in Dublin at this time was built by homeowner cooperatives called public utility societies where people uh, got together and pushed the builder to build an estate which they, they bought and mostly built on land provided by the council. So in that context, housing was built on the time on land that development land prices were very low. There were very few barriers to building housing. Um, uh, apart from obviously finding, finding money for, for, um, for uh, construction, but generally um, land access um, wasn't, a, wasn't a barrier. And right across Western Europe, we saw a big boom in social housing output at the same time in the, in the three decades after World War II. And cheap land was a critical enabler of, of that development. And again, most countries were operating in a similar context of very little to competition from the private sector for land, um, and also a, a weak land use planning system. So as governments started to appreciate that we needed to plan cities more comprehensively and land use planning system developed, um, there was more regulation of, of the use of land. Um, and also as the private sector and private housing output started to rise again, there was much more competition um, for land. So land prices rose very, very significantly in most countries from the 1970s. Um, so in that context, if you look around Europe and you look at which countries managed to keep, you know, adequate levels of social housing supply, build adequate levels of affordable housing and which countries that didn't, government's approach to land in this context was critical. So Julie mentioned Vienna and uh, the Vienna Land Bank or Bone Fund, which we're going to examine later in the series. Um, it's a very good example of long-term thinking and long-term land assembly supporting high levels of social housing output. Um, our near neighbours in England and Wales are, are an example of an alternative approach. So until the, the late 1950s, it's very high council housing output in England and Wales. Um, dependent on cheap land, which was bought at existing use value by councils. So when that provision was removed, output started to um, stagnate and then decline. And in recent years, we've seen um, local government in England and Wales selling off land for, for housing, but also to plug gaps in, in local government funding. And land is sent, sent itself, sold to the highest bidder, and it's delivered relatively little social housing. Um, so that's increased the cost of social house building um, because we have to buy land at commercial prices. There's very little land available and also depressed output. So if you look around Europe, um, many things influence the, the supply of social housing, um, obviously, uh, but land policy is a really critical element of, um, 
of that and one that's often overlooked by policymakers. So the other kind of purpose of this um, seminar series is to look at what's being done around the rest of Europe and therefore um, uh, what ideas the Irish government can draw on or maybe consider that how it can intervene in land markets more effectively. So Bob already mentioned the, the topics we're going to examine in the rest of the seminar series. Um, and uh, here are some of the dates. So um, these will be very applied events where we look at what's being done abroad and reflect on, on, on its relevance to Ireland. You can see we're going to examine public land banking, leasing, land pooling and readjustment, which Julie also mentioned, land value capture, um, land value tax, and then inclusion rezoning finally in, in that period. Now, when considering what we can take from abroad, it's, it's important to understand that um, certainly over the last 20 years, the Irish government has, has started to get more involved in land policy again after a period um, in which the state kind of withdrew. Um, so local authorities have a very long track record of uh, assembling land banks for their own use. Not in recent decades, though, since, since the early 2000s, their land purchases have been quite low. Um, so uh, in 2018, the government uh, uh, intervened to address this by the establishment of the land, the land development agency responsible for managing public land. And is one of the biggest interventions we've seen in land markets in, in Ireland for many decades. And I think very important social and affordable housing cut, um, delivery. Uh, we also use land value capture mechanisms here through development contributions. Private developers use our private developers are required to pay to fund land service and cost provision of infrastructure, roads, etc. Um, we don't have a comprehensive land value tax, which is one of the things we're going to examine um, in the series, but we do have a, a more targeted version of it in the vacant sites levy. And we do use inclusion rezoning very widely in the form of part five of the 2000. Um, planning Act, um, which requires developers to, to um, uh, supply up to 20% of private developments for social and affordable housing for sale and, and also for cost rental housing. So the active management, management of land in Ireland, which was traditionally very strong, um, and then kind of went into a bank for a period as it has expanded, in, certainly in the last 20 years. Um, so as I mentioned, the purpose of the seminars is to provide an opportunity to learn from strategies used elsewhere um, and to, to give us an opportunity to discuss, I'm just going to suggest a couple of, of issues worth looking at. Um, what can we learn about the effectiveness of the existing tools we use in Ireland? How can they be improved to better support social and affordable housing delivery? And what options are there for maybe expanding these suite of measures? Could some of the land policy tools used abroad like land leasing, for instance, or land value tax be employed in the Irish context, what benefits would they bring and how would they interact with the existing policy? Michelle, maybe you'd like to join me at the front here for the Q&A and <laughs> 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 the okay. now, yeah, <laughs> We should have Julie on the screen now as well, momentarily. Right, just so, while we're getting Julie set up in the room here, I'd just like to remind our online audience that, you know, I am kind of monitoring the comments and the questions section here. So, you know, please do, you know, kind of pop questions that you may have in here and I'll be able to, to, to feed them into, into, um, into, into Julie and Michelle. Um, but I guess maybe just to, to, to kind of, Get us get us going, and like maybe people in the room might want to take the questions they have. Well, I mean, Michelle, you like and Julie, you both like outlined a number of of different you know land management tools here in your presentations. But I guess to put a put a I don't know, maybe put a little bit of pressure on you on this. But if you had to choose one, you know that would be you know particularly useful. What and 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 and, and to go with what do you think would be an, a particularly interesting one to learn from? Um, and if, if you had to choose among this kind of array of, of, uh, of, of topics you like going. Um, will I go first? Um, I think in the Irish context, among what we don't use, the, the, the interventions we don't use now, I think the one that um, uh, I think could be very beneficial here is land leasing. Um, so if you look at, for instance, um, countries like uh, Finland, they have public land bankers, but land is then supplied on for affordable housing delivery. 
uh, but on a leased basis, it has to be kept as affordable housing over the long term. And I think one of the challenges we have in Ireland is we've been very good in the past in providing relatively high levels of social and affordable housing, but it's been what I call temporarily affordable housing. So it's affordable to, of course, the purchaser when it's just through affordable housing schemes, but then it's sold on at market value. It's sold off a lot of the social housing we, we built in the past. Um, so things like land leasing could be useful mechanisms to ensure the housing remains affordable long term, not just to the initial purchaser. But I'm interested in hearing what they're doing about that in, in Helsinki. Yeah. Please come in on that. I, I, in addition to that, um, I think working together between the Land Development Agency and the Housing Agency um, is crucial in terms of having uh, the investment or the co-investment, for example, grant program, et cetera, working together with the um, segmented housing vision of the Land Development Agency. So if they were... If, if where you see agencies like those working closely together, if you like hand in glove with a, a good plan for housing and a good uh, land banking working behind it, um, then you can see a lot of clarity and that segments of the housing market aren't overlooked. Um, they've thought about it and they, they, they have a long term pipeline that can um, sit behind and drive good supply outcomes. And when there's clarity and certainty, then you get then you get the headspace for innovation and experimentation as well. So those things create the conditions for um, a much more flourishing um, affordable housing sector. So you see that happening in, 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 in Vienna where you've got Vonfont, um, which is able to generate the sites, uh, create um, a, a, if you like, a very good um, Yeah, Judy may just be having connection issues here, so we might just give her a moment to see if she, um, if she comes back in. Yeah, would you be happy to, to, to field another question while we're, we're just waiting for, for, for Judy to, to, to read it? Yes, go ahead. Or obviously, Bob and John are here as well. Yes. So, you did a great job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I might ask uh, Camille Loftus here. Uh, uh, Camille Loftus, I'm Executive Director of the Housing Alliance for, for, for those of you who don't know, represents some of the largest housing, not-for-profit housing providers in the country. Uh, our members are currently delivering around 40% of the national supply of social housing and have delivered the first and only uh, cost rental homes in Ireland to date. Um, I would anticipate our numbers are going to slip uh, because not only do we have an issue with, with the funding mechanism kind of having reached the end of its road right now, we can't get access to land. Uh, largely, the AHP's access to land in Ireland is, is, is effectively practically reduced now to Part 5 development. Um, as far as we can see in terms of the development of the uh, local housing action development plans, uh, housing development action plans at local level, there we go, um, that most of that public land back that was held by the local authorities will be used by the local authorities themselves. Um, uh, and so, like, we don't have a mechanism of, of getting access to those things. And at the point when the funding uh, is, is under very severe pressure and aggravated by rising construction costs, rising financing costs, um, and we have very limited debt capacity, the, the, this sort of powerhouse of delivery, as our chair has, has described it, can only slow down, not because it wants to, because it absolutely does not want to, but because we can't access land. Um, and so I wonder, Michelle, why do you think when we were so good at this? I mean, maybe we were just accidentally good at it, you know what I mean? Maybe we didn't realize how good we were at it at the time. But I mean, 
that, that impetus around the management of land seems to have been lost from our system entirely now. Uh, and, and it seems like it'll be quite an effort to bring it back, uh, bring it back up to get that sustainable supply of, of, of land for house building. Um, uh, well, I suppose you've raised a couple of issues there, so let me just respond to them uh, one at a time. I think if you look at what is good practice in this area uh, internationally, one of the key features is long-term thinking and long-term supply. So that's something we haven't always been good at in this country. Um, so within the local government sector, for instance, local authorities borrow from the Housing Finance Agency to buy land. And um, uh, that financing mechanism became quite problematic during the, the last bust because they, they borrow the money and then the money is paid down when they build social housing on it. And there was quite a, often quite a delay between buying the land, borrowing the money and uh, building the social housing. So it became very difficult for local authorities to manage. And there's been very little purchase of land by local authorities since 2002. So there is a kind of a, a view there that there's lots of, of local authority land for building. Um, in my view, it's much more complicated. It's not always where the demand is, it's not always you know, in, in the right location in the city. So I think one of the key issues is just inter injecting some long-term thinking. Um, so that's why, in my view, the development of the Land Development Agency has been extremely positive. Um, and also local authorities and AHBs need to be funded and empowered to buy land and critically buy land well ahead of its zoning and use. So in Vienna, it, the, the land is bought well ahead of, of its use. So it's really long term thinking. I also think um, in relation to the issues around approved housing bodies and access to land, um, it's really critical that we build more social housing from scratch, particularly if we're going to need, meet the needs of smaller households who dominate the, the waiting list. And um, if, if we're reliant on turnkey housing, that tends to be three and four, four bedroom housing. So we need to build smaller units for the 62% of households on the waiting list for one or two bedroom households. I think an, a good model we could use again is going back to Vienna, where Vienna Land has what's called developer competitions, where they put out land, make it available to the nonprofit sector. Um, but there's competition, uh, a public competition for putting forward proposals for developing the land. So it, it, it's a way in which they drive down costs, encourage best, best practice, and also have a, a, you know, a, um, a, a formal public tendering event. Um, so I think measures like that um, should be looked at, but certainly the um, particularly we're going to meet the needs, the particular needs of households on the social housing waiting list and households and homelessness, most of them are single people. It's really critical when we need to facilitate land access and building. Can I just add one quick point onto that? Because in, in, in discussions with the department around this, it has frequently been suggested to us that what we should do is just go ahead and buy the land. The difficulty with that is that large development AHBs in Ireland now carry such a high level of debt that the available debt capacity they have left with which to develop new housing, if that's eaten up by buying land, they can develop fewer homes. Um, so so like, we, we need to find a more creative way of using the, the, the finance that's available because uh, there isn't enough of it to, to do all of those things. Well, they could also um, invest equity in, in land purchase, and that's another feature, I think, of the, the model used in Austria that's very um, positive. Uh, uh, their version of housing associations are required by law to reinvest um, equity in, in development and land purchase, and that keeps, um, that keeps the cost down. Um, we need to come up with kind of a, essentially, it's basically a revolving fund with money comes in, the debt's paid down. They would invest equity in new housing. That's how they do, they do it. And the details are complicated, but the, the model isn't. So we need to be moving in, in that direction. And, and the leasing that you mentioned early on, which is a uh, you know, way of you know, getting around that issue um, very much, that um, the, the land doesn't need to be purchased. It could be simply leased from the public land bank, for example, over 99 years or, or more. Well, I'm not sure how are we going for time because uh I'm just we we've hit the hour now, but yeah. if it's okay, I would like to at least bring 
we've got a number of questions from online so if we might hold on for another five minutes if that's okay i feel we could probably keep going until at least two o'clock if we wanted yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would like to bring in just maybe one or two quick questions from, from the online audience, if, if, if that's okay. Um, one of them is, I guess, particularly to do with the, the rural context in, in, in Ireland, where there's a lot of vacant land inherited by family members who either can't or don't use it. Um, and the question is just what the panelists might think about that and whether there is, there, there, there's an approach that can be taken there. And then another one, um, which I think is particularly interesting and which we might go back to in later sessions as well, is just around um, challenges um, for sites that require significant infrastructural investment um, and or the consolidation and or relocation of users and what are the best you know kind of suited measures to, to unlocking those those challenges well they're they're very big questions and so I'll be I'll be as quick as I can but refer perhaps to particular um, solutions that are discussed in the report. Um, one of them would be the um, the process involved in the in Singapore with the Land Resettlement Act, um, whereby isolated uh, or particular parcels of undeveloped land enable um, uh, owners to be recompensed in terms of um, allocated dwellings within the new development. So that's one way that uh, that Singapore was able to transform um, its underutilized uh, semi-informal um, settlements towards um, more consolidated uh, um, housing forms with it, providing outcomes for those um, former um, residents. Um, forms of compensation are also uh, talked about and mechanisms for negotiation and discussion are mentioned in the report with regards to um, in Germany in the land adjustment there. Um, it might also be interesting to go into the history books and look at the 1949 um, Land Act in Finland which enabled people um, who had uh, farmland on the edge of cities um, to become incorporated in the develop, redevelopment of the new cities. And there's, there's interesting precedents there, which led to municipalities playing a much more proactive and engaged role in the futures of their cities. Um, that's, that's something for the historians to rediscover in, in many ways. But um, it's a bigger topic, and I'm hoping that when you get to the seminar on public land banking, <laughs> Um, you'll have a more considered uh, uh, and more contextualised discussion. Thanks. And maybe, Michelle, I'm sure if you'd like to take the question about um, infrastructure and um, what might be appropriate to unlocking challenging sites that require a significant infrastructural investment. Um, well, I think the key in terms of on, on challenging sites and particularly brownfield sites in, in cities, master planning is is critical. So the LDA, for instance, is engaged in two large master planning um, uh, projects, one in Galway and one in Limerick around Covert Station, the train station in Limerick. Um, so that process of master planning allows um, for long term planning of future land uses. Um, so in the Covert site, it's, it's very large. It allows you know, for the private sector to, to, to plan their planning output there and also allows for proper planning and uh, provision of the infrastructure that needs to go in. So I think it's that, that um, in particular is, is absolutely critical to what we're doing here, what we, unlocking those complicated brownfield sites in the Irish context. Right. So we just offer yeah. some of the names of you and that, Michelle. I think like the, the the problem has been that you have large scale areas and you have multiple landowners, but in the coordination of those uh, to get to delivery and building and their individual capabilities differing. Like if you say, for instance, we have strategic development zones which have you know been slow to get going, uh, and a lot of them were uh, crystallized pre global financial crisis. Then you had individual landowners going bust. None of them in a position or their creditor has been in a position to make any plans to advance infrastructure or anything like that. And I think there's a, there's a clue in the urban development zones that are forthcoming about the ability to, for the state to play a much more interventionist role to force 
uh, delivery. We have a funding mechanism in place now, the URDF, uh, which is, look, it's a, we get particular acronyms, but it's a bunch of money that, that's available to provide large scale infrastructure to facilitate these large scale areas. But the key is, um, as the child outlined, a big planning framework in place first, so you can diagnose the issues of totality, cost them, put a plan in place to finance them, and now hopefully with the UDZ, uh, a mechanism to deploy it. Thanks very much for that uh, input, John. Yeah, and um, you know, I mean, I think all this shows is that there's plenty to talk about over the, you know, the the, the six sessions ahead of us. You know, so um, before we finish up, I'd just like to once again point out that our next session is going to be in two weeks' time on the 18th of October, and um, when we'll be talking about public land banking, and we will be hearing from a speaker from Von von Zien, which has been mentioned several times in in, in in today's today's session. So uh, really looking forward to get in, getting into the detail on that. So we will be distributing the link and the registration information and all of that to 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 list afterwards. So um, other than that, I'd just like to finish up by uh, asking for a round of applause to thank uh, <laughs> Thank you for online audience. I hope to see you in two weeks' time.